Hello there, I'm Mike Flanagan, and you are watching Ouija Origin of Evil. Uh, what you're seeing there is actually the classic Universal logo. One of the things that I was very excited about when we started developing this project was to try to recreate the kind of experience I had when I was 12, 13, and, and kind of first getting into the horror genre, kind of dipping my, my toe in the pool. And a lot of those movies that I love so much just had such a specific feel to them uh, that I hadn't really seen in a very long time. And so it was really important for us to try from the very beginning to make this as an immersive kind of nostalgic experience as we could. That was what we wanted to do. And uh, as Universal kind of saw what we were going for, they offered us the chance to use that classic logo. And, and I just thought it set the perfect tone uh, right out the gate. So, uh, this scene was actually uh, the reason that I wanted to make the film. What was your wife's name? We had talked a lot about, about psychics and mediums um, and about what Ouija boards were used for kind of over the course of their very long history. And one of the things that I found really fascinating was the way psychics and mediums would employ them. But not only that, how often what they were doing was actually kind of fraudulent. Mary Browning. We invite you into our circle. We seek you in love and light. Dad, don't give Bringing this family into it that, you know, make their living by trying to make people feel comfort, but doing it fraudulently was a really, it was really interesting. It was not something that I'd gotten to play with much before. But I've always been fascinated by Harry Houdini, uh, who spent most of his life trying to actively debunk psychics. Mary. And he would go to seances, he would go to things like that. And he would use his knowledge of, of illusion and, and showmanship uh, to debunk what they were doing. And uh, the opportunity to kind of play in a scene like that was, was hard to resist. So you're taking a look here at some of my favorite actors. Uh, Elizabeth Reeser who plays Alice. There's Kate Siegel from Hush. A lot of people don't recognize Kate with, uh, with the blonde hair. And the great Sam Anderson. Mary, we ask that you let the candle burn if the answer is yes. Blow it out if the answer is no. One of the other things you'll notice kind of as the movie goes along is that we opted to shoot the entire movie on antique lenses. We wanted to make sure that we kind of captured that antique feel to it. And in order to accomplish that, uh, we requested a, a fantastic antique lens package and uh, we were able to use it. The pain she felt before. We also uh, shot this film uh, anamorphic um, and actually cropped the sides so that it would fit, uh, fit in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio um, so that you'll notice a lot of the artifacts of anamorphic filmmaking uh, in the way it, it handles light. Um, and uh, what you won't see, though, is, is the widescreen you associate with anamorphic. And that was, a, that was a very kind of fun way to work. It was something that we hadn't gotten to play with before. And my, my DP, Mike Viminari, who did this film and also did Oculus and Before I Wake with me, I was very excited about it. You can see kind of uh, the way the lenses are, are treating those, those flames. Be here much longer. Huh. Ask your last question. Now, standing uh, behind the curtain there is Annalise Basso. Uh, Annalise I'd worked with first in Oculus, uh, which we shot back in 2012. Uh, she was only 13 at the time. And so when I sat down to work on the script for this story, uh, we knew there was a teenage protagonist, and I wrote it with Annalise in mind. I, I had been so impressed with her when we worked together before. Uh, it, seemed, it seemed like this would be perfect for her. And uh, she had really grown up as, you know, as a young woman and, and as an actress. And so it was a, a real treat for me to kind of see how she's evolved over the years. <laughs> we had a, uh, we had rigged this table. Our effects team had rigged it so that we could blow out the candles, we could kind of affect everything we needed to do as though uh, we were Alice and we were rigging it our, ourselves, uh, which resulted in some interesting things. Um, when you let a candle burn for a couple of minutes and then you blow it out um, from within, it sprays boiling wax out in all directions, uh, which is something we learned very fast with the cast. She's at peace and she loves you. That's all to take away from today. The rest is the business of the living. 
This house that they're standing in front of was actually the exterior house that was used in the first Ouija film. It's one of the few connections we have to the first movie, other than a few story points. The interior and exterior of that house are two different locations. This is now a different house. Uh, also the same one that was used for the interior of the first Ouija film. And this uh, house was also used for Lights Out, which wrapped about two days before we moved into the space. It's an incredible, incredible location and uh, really, really adds quite a bit to it. And here is Lulu Wilson. <laughs> One of the things that's kind of neat about that cabinet, um, it, it's hard to see at a first glance, uh, when you see her putting the candle down and see the reflection above it, it's a very old magic trick uh, to take to take a, a cube and lay a mirror diagonally across it from the top to the bottom which gives it the illusion of being empty, and uh, Lulu was hiding on the other side of the mirror. What's a scam? The lady said we were a scam. Doris, listen to me. One of the things that I really wanted to do with this film, which I alluded to before, was uh, to kind of recreate Peace. the way I, I remember experiencing uh, movies in the 80s and, and in the late 70s in particular. A lot of that, a lot of that energy got kind of poured into not only the aesthetic of the film and, and kind of looking at the way the light is blooming. We had a, a net behind the, uh, uh, behind the lenses in order to accomplish that. But um, also in the way they're dressed and in the way we were framing the shots. Um, the movies that we watched the most in prep to kind of get ready for this uh, were The Exorcist, The Changeling, uh, poltergeist, and this incredible movie called uh, Watcher in the Woods that I remember terrifying me when I was little. It was one of the fir first horror films I ever saw. And a lot of those movies, you can feel their fingerprints over this. Uh, uh, ten more minutes. Mm, I'm sorry, sweetie. It's a school night. Come here. Well, we made uh, a lot of decisions about whether or not we wanted to do Dolly... Uh, movies like you just saw, or Zooms. We tried to default to Zooms quite a bit, uh, just because it was a technique that was really, really popular in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and kind of went out of vogue as we were able to move cameras more easily, and especially these days. Everything is this very smooth, gliding, steady cam, and it was really fun to kind of not always lean on that. Um, I feel like a lot of movies look the same because of the way they're leaning on steady cam, and a chance to use, you know, very very specific dolly work and, and uh, very long, clearly human-operated zooms. It's definitely a strategy that I'd never gotten to play with before. And so that ended up being, you know, one of the, one of the more exciting aspects of this. I'd rather talk to Daddy, but he never answers. The people we help, their mommies and daddies in heaven talk to them. Why doesn't Daddy talk to us? Just because you can't hear him doesn't mean he isn't there. The music you're hearing was composed by the Newton Brothers. The Newton Brothers have done all of my movies since Oculus. So this is our fourth together. And for this, again, it was all about trying to recreate that feel of some of our favorite movies from the 80s. And we listened to a lot of Jerry Goldsmith scores, particularly The Omen and Poltergeist, in order to kind of build this orchestral score that wouldn't necessarily knock a contemporary viewer out of the experience of the movie but would really kind of feel familiar to people uh, that grew up watching the same kind of movies I did. I basically was looking at PG-13 horror because there's a stigma to it in a lot of circles. Uh, it's kind of viewed as being not as legitimate as, you know, its R-rated counterpart. And I don't think that's really fair. I, I also don't think it needs to be the case. A lot of the scariest movies I'd ever seen were PG-13, the only real difference is, you know, the level of gore and, and violence and things like that that you can show. But when it comes to tension and atmosphere, there's really no difference. And one of the things that we talked about so much with uh, Jason Blum and with uh, the guys at Platinum Dunes and Universal at the very beginning uh, was this idea that, you know, people give PG-13 horror a really hard time. And we all agreed, you know, that didn't need to be the case. You know, 13-year-olds uh, deserve movies with, with complex characterizations and sophisticated aesthetics, you know, just as much as anybody else. And the chance to try to turn that tide a little bit was also something that made me really want to make this film.
My mom just got that. She and her bridge club friends play it sometimes. Is that the one where you talk to ghosts? I remember this day of production very well. It was early in the schedule, and we had to shoot everything in this house all in one night, and it was one of the longest nights of the entire production. We started just as the sun went down, and we wrapped uh, about half an hour after sunrise the next morning. I think it was a 15-hour shoot day. The rules. Never play alone. This was Never. kind of the only time we, we did the thing that I thought everyone would expect from a sequel to Ouija, which was to put a group of teenagers together in a room playing. It was one of those things where I, I figured we had to have the scene, and it had to end in a jump scare that couldn't be supernatural. Mm -hmm. There's this sense when you're working on a horror movie that you need to have a jump scare every, you know, however many of minutes it is, depending on who you're making it for. And uh, I don't like jump scares in general. I think they, they disrupt the tension that, that you try to build. And uh, with this one in particular, I wanted to kind of think about the way people react to jump scares, which is first they giggle, then they anticipate, then they're startled, the and everyone screams, but then everybody laughs. And so this is a jump scare designed to go right to the laugh and to make room for it. Um, we knew this would be kind of the one false jump scare of the movie. There's nothing drives me crazier than you know, the, uh, the cat jumping into frame or someone tapping someone on the shoulder and that being kind of turned into a, a jump scare. Uh, and this one, it was like, okay, this isn't supernatural. This is going to be a startling scene, uh, but let's hold for a laugh and let's really try to kind of lean into the comedy of it. All right. we all have our this is also some of my favorite lighting that, that Michael uh, yeah, pulled off, it move, so it shooting it next to the swimming pool and kind of bringing the reflection into the room. Yeah. That was one of his first ideas and yeah. I thought it was just gorgeous to look at. You're Fun. Okay, well, if we're just talking to ourselves, then, uh, Spirit, will Lena come to homecoming with me? All of these shots of the Ouija board and the hands were actually the last thing we filmed. We shot this probably five weeks after we shot the scene. Uh, when just uh, our last day of production, we were in a warehouse, or, or on a stage, rather, and uh, we had a bunch of hand doubles. None of the actual cast were there, and their only job was to spell out everything that happened on the Ouija board in every scene of the film. There's no spirit. Ellie! <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that scream, that elongated scream, um, had made us laugh so much. Uh, I think it, it happened during rehearsal. It was, it was, everyone was just punchy, and, and uh, the actors were having so much fun they just did that at rehearsal, and I liked it so much, uh, we had to put it in. Mom, I'm just kidding. But you'll notice, you know, about 10 seconds go by before there's another line of dialogue that we expect people to listen to. And um, this is all just to let people cool off in the theater who are, you know, hopefully laughing after that scare. And every time I've seen the film with an audience, it's gone exactly that way. I know how hard it's been for you, and I understand how you feel, but I need you to help me, Lena, for all of us. I'm asking, honey. I'll try. We're about to come into one of my favorite shots of the movie. Really, board? We good? wanted to try to find a way to, to kind of do these very specifically composed oneers whenever we had an opportunity. And this is one where we took pretty much the entire real estate of the downstairs of the house and three characters with the introduction of a fourth and tried to stage it from one camera position and just deal with uh, zooms and pans, letting them fade off into the background while we just leave the camera here on Doris. You know, this is a, a style of blocking um, that really, to me, was really prevalent in the 70s and uh, has kind of fallen away to this idea that you need to cover everyone um, in a scene. This wasn't true. We let it kind of hand off. She steps off her mark, and Elizabeth steps right up onto it. But the camera still hasn't moved. Who are you? And we didn't even hide an edit in that pan. We went all the way over to the front door and landed on his hand. I remember we had uh, we had drawn that shot out on the on a chalkboard in prep. Not quite. If you trying to see if we could actually accomplish it, because otherwise, you know, your instinct is to try to just set up cameras and cover everybody one at a time. Uh, but we looked for opportunities throughout the film to just let us live in a wonder to let the characters kind of hand off the frame to each other. And that felt, uh, yeah, it was a technique I think um, Spielberg and Polanski 
used so often. You know, if you watch Jaws, it's it's done every few minutes, um, and it's always stuck with me so much. Come on in. Oh, what you just saw there was a real change, uh, something else that was very important to me in thinking about the experience I had of watching movies uh, when I was young. Whenever uh, the reels would change in the projector, you know, you would see a, what they call a cigarette burn up in the top right-hand corner of the screen, uh, which is just a hole that's punched in the film meant to cue the projectionist to switch over to the next reel. And those reel changes would be smooth or they could be rough. Often, because you're at the end of the reel, you'd have, you'd have dust, you'd have damage to the print, and sometimes it would jump the gate. You'd feel that transition, and it was very important to us to try to make sure that we, we captured the imperfection of a reel change. So every reel change in the film, at the point where we would have inserted a reel change were we finishing the film on film, uh, everyone has uh, its cigarette burns, and everyone uh, kind of interacts with the, project, the fake projector uh, differently. And that first one just kind of gently hopped the gate, but there are four more uh, coming. And uh, you'll notice each one has its own special little flavor. Now, this is another example of, you know, trying to kind of take a scene and compress it into one, one long shot. We shot this at a, a working business in Pasadena, California, and uh, we didn't have the budget to kind of dress the entire street, you know, to fit into the period, but much of what this store looked like, you know, felt like a 50s uh, establishment. And so we were able to kind of float through the space, and, and so much of it just worked. That design uh, for the Ouija board box is actually what it looked like in 1967. That was how they marketed uh, the game then, and uh, we wanted to be as authentic as possible. There's a, one of those long zooms I was talking about earlier that, you know, as, a, as an intro into a scene, aren't used very often, and that, that was something that was very important to me that we could use whenever we could. This shot coming up here that introduces Henry Thomas's uh, character, Father Tom, this is quite a camera move here. These are the kind of shots that I remember seeing quite a bit of when I was a kid when introducing a character. Makes me kind of feel sorry for it. A big camera move, kind of letting the camera settle into what should just be its natural end frame. This as well, we decided to try to cover the scene in just one single profile with a a slow, manually operated zoom with the foreground wipes. This, again, a technique that uh, isn't, isn't often used in contemporary cinema. I've been slow making friends since her dad. I know, I, I, I talk about that with her. It's very good of you. I do remember that Henry could not see her. The sun is directly in his eyes. And um, he's squinting just to try to keep his eyes open. Little moments like this here with the car. We also wanted to handle our driving sequences very differently. Seat belts were not, you know, really the, the big deal that they are now uh, back in 67. And so we wanted to be able to kind of move around the car, keep all the characters together, and let them find frame. I loved uh, Lulu just crawling up to the front like that. No one minded, and that, and that was very realistic for the period. Of course, these days, I. I I have a, a six-year-old son as I record this, and I would lose my mind if he moved in a car like that. And this was another shot that we had drawn out very early, and, you know, we wanted to try to, try to make the board as iconic as we could. And it seems like such a simple thing, but I remember that shot took us uh, three quarters of a day to accomplish, finally. Uh, the rules of the Ouija board um, were established in the first film. One of the great things about horror movies that I grew up with were they all had very simple rules. And a lot of that comes with the rating, too. It's, you know, down to gremlins and uh, don't get them wet, don't feed them after midnight. You, you give an audience, uh, you give an audience a, a set of rules and then you watch characters break them, and that uh, is hopefully building anticipation for what's going to happen next. Hey, 
Now this shot, you'll see another technique that's kind of fallen out of vogue lately, which is called a split diopter. This shot of Doris here that allows us to keep Lena and Doris in, in focus and in order to kind of connect those, those two uh, planes of focus, there's, there's a vertical line, blurry line, uh, that divides the shots kind of right on her shoulder, her right shoulder there. And uh, that's a look that I remember being fascinated by when I grew up and, and really started noticing how films were made. It was one of the toys that I really wanted to make sure we had in our arsenal for the movie. I also really wanted to make sure we didn't do anything to try to clean up that vertical line. I wanted to feel it, and I wanted to make sure that we, you know, we handled it the way we would have if, if we were shooting the movie in 1971, about 1967. The sound of this grandfather clock. This was added very, very late in the game. This, this was uh, an invention of our sound mixers um, who had put this together with the sound design. Uh, you'll notice if you watch the movie carefully, there's not a grandfather clock in the house. Roger. But okay. this rhythmic kind of metronome feeling that it, it gave us, I, I found it to be really wonderful at kind of making people anticipate something horrible happening. And whenever we would introduce an actual supernatural element, the pace, I guess the, uh, the frequency of the clock would slow down. And uh, not in a way that you would hopefully notice, but <laughs> in slowing it down subtly, people instinctively know after they've set that rhythm in, in their head, they know that something's different and that something's wrong. Um, and that was really, uh, you know, these little tiny touches like that can actually make audiences feel more afraid than anything explicitly supernatural that we can show. I'm here. If you listen to the music here, uh, the music, this track sounds so goldsmith to me. Uh, this reminds me so much of uh, Poltergeist, in fact. There's really nothing contemporary about this at all. I mean, down to, uh, besides the chord progression, but down to the choice of instrument that the Newtons put together here, it's, it's a beautiful little moment of music. One of the things that they fought hard for was to make sure that we recorded the score with an orchestra, which is also something that doesn't always happen, especially uh, in contemporary horror. We, we tend to, to score modern horror movies amelodically. It's, it's about drones and it's about, you know, mood. And a lot of that is created uh, electronically. You don't actually need mu uh, musicians to accomplish that, and especially on, on lower budget horror. The cost of an orchestra is something that's often the first to go. Uh, but it was very important to us that that we were able to use one, and and I, I I'm very glad they made that decision. The the musicians fought for it very hard, and it I think changes the entire feel of the film. Uh, this is a great example of a low tech scare. Um, this is uh, just a crew member at the foot of the bed pulling on sheets. It's another kind of thing where these days. Your instinct is to score this. Creepy drone here. Maybe a little hit you know, when the sheets get pulled down. We wanted to leave it totally silent because that's how I remembered uh, or how I assumed they would have done it back in the 70s. <laughs> right there is another place you'd really expect music to come back. Get out, Doris. But in leaving it still silent, uh, the scene isn't resolved and the jump scare doesn't I hope, uh, doesn't puncture the tension simply because we're still listening to nothing. Oh, and there in the doorway is our demon. He was not there when we filmed it. That was actually a decision we made in post, was to add him into the shot. And again, it was I, I thought it would be wonderful to add him in as long as we did not uh, add a musical sting. <laughs> that was my only... Only caveat with it. I'm thrilled to see him there, but I don't want to hear anything. Have you been helping Doris? So there's your first little hint about Father Tom's past, uh, that photograph. You know, Doris mentioned it in the car earlier, but this was kind of, we wanted people to see what his life was before he was a priest. And It's nothing like that. There's a scene on this Blu-ray, I believe, where you actually see his wife in Act 3. I took it out of the, uh, the theatrical cut just because it... 
uh, was a little confusing to, to some viewers, and, and it, it seemed to kind of slow the momentum that we had built in the third act. Who's your new friend? I didn't do it. Well, I didn't, and Doris definitely didn't. Well, then I don't know what to tell you. It, it wasn't me. Both of our driving shots were accomplished on a process trailer and just with a short jib arm, just moving the camera back and forth while, uh, while we drove on the Warner Brother lot. Actually, the house they just passed was the house from Lethal Weapon in the background. It's Murdoch's house. It's funny the things you don't think about when you look at shots like this, but we had to go through and look at the houses in the background and start removing satellite dishes. Do you think we'll have to move? I don't know, sweetie. There was initially a scene in between those two uh, where Alice tried to explain to the girls um, that they would have to move and had tried calling the bank. I and uh, I believe those are also going to be on this disc. But one of them featured a, a shot that I didn't know. We couldn't, we, we racked our brains and we couldn't figure out if anyone had ever tried it before, but we used a split diopter, but we used it horizontally so that we had a certain thing in, in, uh, in focus on the lower side of the screen and then Alice in the deep background and focus on the top. And we just could not come up with another example of someone doing that. Daddy. Did you hear that? We might have to move out of our house. Now, coming up here, we had to actually take the exterior of the house and try to marry it to our interior. And these two houses are actually, uh, you, could, you could see them. You could actually walk from one to the other there, um, just across the street and down the way from each other. This was your dad's um, But house. to get this shot with the door open uh, was a huge deal. <laughs> Those were shot at two different locations, weeks apart. And um, we had wanted very much to try to just make it clear that it was the same house. But that was a lot more complicated than we anticipated at first. These walls. Doris doesn't quite get it, does she? No. She thinks he just left, like he went to work. It's better than getting hit by some asshole driving drunk. This was another scene that was initially much longer. We, we wrote and shot a lot more of this conversation between the two of them and about the specifics of how Roger had died and, and what it had done to the family. I always kind of think when, when I'm working on movies like this that if I can take out the supernatural elements, if I can strip out the horror elements and still care about the characters, uh, then the movie will work. And... When Jeff Howard and I sat down to, to write this, we actively avoided the genre elements um, on the first pass uh, until the midpoint um, because we wanted to spend time with the family. And we wanted to approach it as though we were making a movie about a single mother um, in the late 60s and how the death of her husband had affected her and, and her daughters. And that was where we, we put our energy uh, in the script. It's always kind of interesting when suddenly the, then you have to go back and make sure that you're, you're honoring the genre requirements as well. But that's how I approach all of my movies. I need to care about them, regardless of the... You hear the, uh, you hear the audio warping here. That's because we have a real change. There's the cigarette burn and real change. But we, uh, we actually went in and warped uh, the soundtrack. It's still, you can still hear the vestiges of it there. Uh, the pitch is bending a little bit, just as though the optical track uh, on our imaginary film print um, had been through a lot of projectors and had gotten warped over multiple uh, screenings. As friends we gathered, hearts are true. Spirits near, we call to you. Daddy, we found the money. Thank you. This was always... Uh, <laughs> Always one of the areas of the script that I was, <laughs> I was a little unsure about uh, was that they didn't immediately research uh, the hole in the wall to look for more money. Uh, we had to, you know, have Doris explicitly say, I checked, there's no more, because if, you know, if they would have poked their head in with a flashlight, they would have seen a dozen corpses. A lot better if I touched the planchette. Doris, this is mean. It's okay, Lena. 
One of the, my favorite parts about production was any time uh, these three actresses would share a scene together, and this was one of my favorites. Um, there's a, a Zach, our, our special effects guy, is under the table with a magnet uh, operating the planchette because we didn't want any of them to actually be moving it. And uh, I remember how kind of silly it was with them around him, and he was under there. We were calling letters out over the walkie to make sure that he had, a, he had a kind of reverse board on the bottom of the table that he was reading and trying to move his planchette to match. And sometimes it would look perfect from underneath, but because of the way magnets work, um, above, the planchette would miss it by a letter or two and spell something that was just nonsense. <laughs> and I remember the, the actresses trying very hard not to laugh through a lot of this. Is she right? Another piece of score here that just feels so vintage uh, to me. I Isn't love the work they did here. What are you looking at? The idea of looking through a planchette and being able to kind of use that as a, as a portal to, to see things that you can't with your naked eye was... Uh, one of the elements of the first film that I, I thought was really cool. Kind of holding that up to your eye and not knowing what you're going to see, seeing something very close to you that you can't with your naked eye was, I think, a, it was one of those opportunities that we just couldn't really resist. Are you really here? The commitment that Elizabeth Reeser brings to her work and to her character here, I, I had first kind of learned about Elizabeth because I'd seen an indie drama called Sweetland back in, I think it was 2006. The Oculus short film was on the film festival circuit. We were screening at the Fargo Film Festival, and uh, their opening night film was Sweetland, starring Elizabeth Reeser. What? And I remember being just blown away by her, and, and over the years, she's done so much amazing work Better in, than... you know, not only studio uh, work, but in indie dramas in particular. Oh, that 90-degree tilt has now become an in-joke between me and Michael Feminari. We find a place to put that shot in every one of the movies. We've done it since Oculus. Uh, we know we have to do it once. There's always one time where we turn the camera 90 degrees in the middle of a take, and now it's kind of a dare uh, to see if we can find a way to get it in that makes sense for the story. Oh, Mom, it's just a stupid game. My mother was a fortune teller before I was born. Red. These little zooms you're seeing here, again, these were hand-operated. We didn't add them after the fact. There's something kind of classically cinematic about a slow zoom on an, on an actor giving a monologue. and I, I, just, I just love the feel of it. It was all a scam. But yes, Elizabeth brings so much emotional commitment to what she does. And she'd never done a horror movie before. That This, this is not her genre, and I think... One of the reasons why she was excited about it was she didn't approach it like a horror movie. She had really kind of grabbed onto the dramatic and emotional elements of, of this family, and that's what she was there to do. She really enjoyed the genre elements when they came in. They were, they're always fun. I mean, anytime you're doing a horror movie, like, the, the scary stuff is, is the most fun. That's when we're all laughing. Um, but, uh, you know, the entire cast... You know, for, uh, for most of the time they were there, uh, we're saying, I'm, today I'm, I'm shooting a drama. Today, that it's all just about the family, and you can really, uh, you can really see it in the way they perform. Uh, here's another example of not using the uh, the big sting uh, for a jump scare. This moment typically would be accompanied by a, you know, it's like somebody trips over a drum set. But we just wanted him to move, nice and quiet and brought in the clock. It's always so refreshing to me, silence in a horror movie, just ambient sound and uh, not kind of leaning on the, uh, you know, you step on a cat's tail and throw a bowling ball through an orchestra. And, and I, I feel like anybody can startle somebody. If you walk up behind somebody with two cymbals and slam them together, they'll react. Uh, but it's really, it's a different story to try to scare someone quietly. Why? I don't know. We're probably on long zoom number 25 uh, for the movie so far, <laughs> 36 minutes in. Not, it's just a dumb dance. <laughs> I do. Um, Parker Mack, who plays Mikey here, 
such a charming, charming young actor. And really, uh, his chemistry with Annalise was kind of immediate. I'm not. I'm not cool. I mean. <laughs> well, what's wrong about that? He has this very, just this classic face. And, uh, you know, the teenage, the teenage love interest story. Um, <laughs> Mr. Russell, um, Father Cockblock, good to see you. The teenage love stories for these don't always interest me, but I, I really, uh, I was really pleased with the way the two of them were playing that. Only you're not. No, it's not about that. There was also uh, a lot of work we tried to do with Father Tom here, of of having him not just be, you know, the the Catholic priest who shows up in the story to be the exorcist and talk about the devil and all that stuff. We wanted him to. You know, this is a man who was married. This is a man who didn't come into the priesthood uh, as his first choice in life. To talk to you about your sister. And who takes, you know, takes time to kind of step away, uh, not to talk about scary things and demons and the devil, but to talk about, you know, dating and, and understanding what teenagers are going through in the 60s in his school and, and just looking after, after Doris. Uh, Henry, you know, I, I got to say something to Henry Thomas uh, the first time I met him when he had come in to talk about doing the movie uh, that I, I will never get to say to another actor, what do you mean? Uh, which is I've, I've been a fan of yours as long as I've been a fan of movies. What do you I, I so vividly remember the first time I saw E.T. and uh, how intensely I identified with Henry in that movie. Is he proud of me? Um, and to, to be able to work with him was very surreal. Uh, this is one of uh, my favorite compositions in the film, this shot of Doris, this frontal this jack-o'-lantern in the design behind her, this eyes and a smile, it's just so classically Halloween. Always. <laughs> that tickled. And she's kind of right in the mouth there. That's one of the, uh, one of the beautiful things about having a, a wonderful production designer. Uh, and Patricia O'Farrell, who designed this movie for me, uh, had also done Before I Wake uh, with me. I can't thank you. And uh, I remember the first time I saw what he had lined up for that. and. Our pleasure. I was just really, really impressed with him. So here we are. We're about 40 minutes into the movie, which is where we're, we're actually kind of just transitioning into Act 2. And that's pretty late, especially for a genre film. Typically, you should kind of start to step on the gas here with the genre elements about 15 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago but it was important that we spend as much time with the characters as possible. My neck hurts. To have support in spending that much time, you know, coming from, from uh, Universal and Platinum Dunes and, and Blumhouse, um, having, you know, kind of three juggernaut <laughs> producers uh, involved with it. Um, I was really amazed and grateful for that because there's this sense that you need to get to the scary, get to the scary, get to it as fast as you can. And uh, to let us really spend 40 minutes with atmosphere and with character was really a gift. And that's how I remember, you know, the movies that I love. Uh, when I watch The Exorcist, which I try to do once a year, whether, whether I need it or not, um, when I watch that movie, they, they take their time so beautifully in, in getting into uh, the supernatural elements. And the result is that not only do you care about everyone on the screen, um, but you've, as a viewer, accepted that as reality. If you get into the supernatural too fast, it tells the audience that this is just a horror movie, that this is, this is an exercise in genre, and it kind of excuses you. Uh, it, it lets you check out. You don't, have to, you don't have to invest in these characters. This isn't real. This is just a horror film. But the longer you can delay that moment, the more people will be involved. There's one of our loud noise jump scares, but not an orchestral sting. We, we went with a creaky floor and just turned the volume up a little bit. Um, stuff like that is way more fun for me than, than the big stings and the hits. And there's a big sting and hit, which is actually the first time we've used one in this film, 40 minutes in to a, to a genre sting. Now, I should talk a little bit about Lulu Wilson. Um, Lulu came in to audition uh, for Doris with, with a number of other young actresses, and, and we knew we were at demanding a lot of, of whoever was going to get cast. And Lulu uh, just blew us out of, the, out of the water the minute she came in. Um, 
her audition scene I'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, right now we're going to be seeing Doug Jones. <laughs> Yep, and that's a stunt Lulu actually did on wires. And she performed all that. This uh, this shot was a little little reference to The Exorcist. They do a similar shot early on when uh, Ellen Burstyn's with the psychiatrists. And then here comes another real change. Then you can hear some dust on the print there. But so Doug Jones, who who plays our demon here, you just saw in the mirror. Uh, Doug, I, I had first met on my first horror feature, Absentia, which is a tiny movie. Uh, we shot it for 70 grand in my apartment. I kind of owe my career to that movie. And Doug had uh, come on board to be in it for one scene, one day. And, uh, oh, and that uh, little shadow of, uh, of Lulu in the doorway there um, was actually, it looks like a special effect, and it's not. That was, that was all practical. She actually ducked out of the way. But yeah, Doug is, you know, such an incredible, incredible performer and does so many, uh, so many memorable kind of creature parts, um, especially for Guillermo del Toro. And, you know, Doug was the fawn in Pan's Labyrinth and the Pale Man and Abe Sapien in Hellboy. And, and he was gracious enough to join us for one day on that little movie. And ever since then, I've said, if, if Doug is available, I want him in everything that I do. And he was kind enough to join us just for, for a little bit in this. This scene is actually a, a bit of a, a bit of a mirror to uh, to a scene in the first film, uh, where a character is looking in the mirror and, and is flossing, and it kind of turns into the stitched mouth that became kind of an expression of DZ or Doris Xander who is, the, of course, the, the ghost in the first movie. It was very important to all of us that this movie stand alone, that fans of the first film would still be able to kind of pick up on some connections, but we wanted it to be that if, if people had never seen the first film, they'd still be able to come in and, and watch this and enjoy it for what it is. But that was one of the little references we tried to protect. And these boys. <laughs> I remember uh, shooting this, we were shooting... Um, one afternoon, I want to say Burbank, but I might be wrong about that, but having to act this slingshot bit is actually really nerve-wracking. Uh, but we had a, a slingshot that we had rigged so that it lost its elasticity so that if he pointed it at his face, he wouldn't accidentally do exactly what we wanted him to do in the movie. And that's just Lulu Wilson being Lulu Wilson. She can do more with stillness than a lot of actors, well, well beyond her years. She's doing it in this scene as well. What? One of the things you'll notice in the background here is an actual newsreel about the space race in the 60s. I am fascinated by NASA, and so any chance that I could get away with to bring in the Apollo missions into the story, I really wanted to. This scene was shot at the Cicada Club in downtown Los Angeles, which is an amazing place. When I first moved to L.A., it was one of my favorite places to go because it's like stepping back in time. On the weekends, they'll bring in a full brass band. People dress in period clothing. Uh, it's, it's quite an experience. And so an opportunity to shoot there was impossible to pass up. Oh, I thought you could use a night away from This was one of the more controversial scenes in the script. To heat up the spaghettios. It was it was always something that I I was kind of interested in when we were writing was that there was an attraction uh, between Father Tom and Alice, twice a week. which is a dangerous narrative thread to, to pursue in a PG thirteen film. It can really really upset people, and so having a chance for them to go out and and have kind of a uh, just an adult conversation was something that I really, really wanted to do. And I wanted to intercut it with a sequence with Lena um, so that we see two, two adults whose lives have taken them in very different directions, who have suffered great losses, uh, both of their spouses. You know, the, it's a, a widow and a widower sitting to dinner. And intercutting that with, you know, this is Lena's first kiss. Uh, there's a deleted scene that may be on the disc where she confesses at school that she's never kissed a boy. And so this was a, a big deal for her. And kind of seeing the, 
you know, the very first glimpses of, of romance in a young woman's life and kind of holding that up against these two who have lost so much and have an attraction but will never act on it. That's the kind of stuff that excites me about a movie. It's not typically something that you, you try to put into a PG-13 um, horror film and certainly not, uh, not a horror sequel, but this is the kind of stuff that I, that I love. And it changes things. I, I think the, these little moments, even though it, it slows down the supernatural action of the movie, this really makes them people for me. Who says I don't want to? I, I didn't have a chance to tell her all the things I wanted to tell her before she passed away. Mm, you never do. But we had taken this further too. This this scene used to be significantly longer, and and I always knew that this was going to be the scene when when we tested the film and when we were putting it in front of younger audiences in particular. Uh, this would be the one where everyone started looking at their watch. Glory and I we used to come here once a month. But kind of knowing that we were shortly going to get into all of the goodies and all of the candy and, and everything that, uh, that the genre requires. It, it was just really important to me that we get to, to live in this moment for just a minute Felt like those days were and spend some, some time with some wonderful actors who are really playing with, you know, loss in a very grown-up way. Well, I guess I kind of made sure of that, didn't I? Well, they weren't over before the seminary. I didn't think this through. <laughs> Maybe in another life. Here's to another life, then. Everything about this I love, except that it looks like Kool-Aid in their glasses. <laughs> but, um, you can't win them all. Oh, uh, over Mikey's shoulder there is a, a poster for Rear Window. And uh, what you're about to see is an almost shot-for-shot -shot recreation of what I consider to be the best kiss ever captured on film, which is uh, from Rear Window between uh, Jimmy Stewart and Grace Kelly. We actually added that poster digitally. It wasn't there on the, on the day. We didn't know if we could clear it. Um, and I'd always wanted, you know, if you're going to make a reference this specific as a filmmaker, um, I wanted to cite the source, and so it took us longer than expected to, you know, find out if we could actually use the image from the poster. And when Universal gave us their blessing, um, we, we put it in digitally. But the reason why is that this shot sequence is pretty much verbatim um, what, uh, what happens in Rear Window. <laughs> and it was kind of one of those things where I said, I really want to do, I want to recreate this perfect on-screen kiss. And they said, well, most of the, the viewers who see the movie won't won't be like, oh, yes, rear window. But so that shot sequence is Jimmy Stewart opening his eyes. Uh, Grace Kelly down the barrel leans in toward the camera. And then a profile that slightly stuttered as they kiss. Um, the frame rate was adjusted just, just a little bit. And it's not a clean adjustment in that film. And then it kind of snaps back into regular time. And as Grace Kelly leaned away from him, um, the camera pivoted and pulled back around Jimmy Stewart exactly like that. And so that little tiny shot sequence, I remember the first time I, I you know, growing up, I, I was fascinated by Hitchcock movies. It was one of the, my first kind of ways into the genre. And so a chance to really, really try to, to homage that was, was very important to me. <laughs> this monologue. Uh, this is the monologue that Lulu Wilson auditioned with. She came in, she knew it completely by heart and she delivered it pretty much exactly the way you see here. All of the other actors uh, who had come in made the choice, which is the obvious choice, uh, because what she's saying is so creepy. They delivered it uh, in a very creepy way. They tried to make it very scary. But Lulu delivered it like this, which was casual and uh, kind of pleasant. And it was such a sophisticated choice, especially for an actor her age. Uh, I knew in that instant, I knew by this point of the monologue that that was who we were going to cast. The part was hers at that point. And you'll notice um, when I was editing this, we had this shot of Parker listening with, with another uh, Zoom uh, to complement this so we could, you know, cut around it and edit the monologue. I could not bring myself to edit away from her. This is all just one take. This is actually her first take. And uh, I couldn't cut away. It's cold. Until she was finished. And that's him at the end of his Zoom that you never got to see because I couldn't cut away from Lulu Wilson. Good night, Romeo. 
I remember we had done a version of this scene where suddenly music kicked in here that was creepy, wasn't that scary. And we pulled the music out and just kind of let it play silent, listen to the static on the TV. Um, and it just felt right. I think this movie asks an extraordinary amount uh, from Lulu Wilson, and I think she carries so much of it on her shoulders. Uh, for someone her age, that's incredible. It's incredible for, for an adult. That I, I expect that we'll be seeing a lot more of her. Now, this scene here involving the doll um, is another one of the references we make to the first film. This, uh, this doll is actually found in the attic uh, of the house. Olivia Cook goes up there and, and finds this doll. What the hell did you do this for? I didn't. Dad gave me this, and you know that! I didn't do it. Daddy did. Stop the voices. Now, who actually did that to the doll is something I'll come back to, but that was uh, one of the, the more involved conversations we had in, in writing, whether Doris actually did this to the doll, um, whether their father's ghost somehow did this in order to try to, to tell them something. I have my ideas about that, but I'll get to that when we get toward the end. You can live in this fantasy world all you want, but you can leave me out of it. And you know what? You can leave Dad out of it, too. Now, this next scene coming up uh, between Elizabeth and Annalise, from a coverage point of view, this, there's always one scene in every movie that you wish you could, you could do again, and this is it for me, not because of the way they perform it. I love the way they perform the scene. I, uh, I ran out of time, and I undercovered. This is a scene that is begging for close-up coverage, and we're living in these mediums. We shot them simultaneously, and uh, I really, really wish I could have gone in because the work that Elizabeth is doing and Annalise is doing really deserves close-up coverage. One of the things about making a movie is you, you always have to compromise as you go, and it's all about how to protect the movie while still making sure that you're making your days and, and spending the agreed-upon money. And This was really the only time, I think, that I, I really wish... Uh, we would have pushed it further. Another hour would have given us these close-ups. Their performances are so uh, heartfelt. And I, I feel like I owe, I owe those actresses close-up coverage for this. And You always kind of come out of a movie feeling at some point like you failed someone. And for this film, that's the one I've always... I always wince when the scene comes up just because I feel like I, I let the actors down by not fighting for that coverage. Late. Little transitions like this, going from nighttime lighting to daytime lighting in a in a shot, instead of you know, it, it's it's a little, it's a little surreal, it's a little hyper stylized, but moments like that just put people off balance. They go by very quickly, and you don't really register what's odd about it. If you take the shot literally, it's that Doris sat there in that chair all night long without moving. If you take it as as kind of an aesthetic stylistic choice. It just helps kind of keep everything a little off balance. This is one of the beats that's very hard to do elegantly, the noticing something beat. And it's, it's a requirement of the genre. The only way you can find out the answers is to have these moments where people search out expositional clues. Uh, in most contemporary movies, they do this on the internet. Lena. You know, you can... <laughs> I, I think you can, you can make a game out of watching contemporary horror and, and seeing how often the, the scene comes up where someone types something into a Google search engine, and that's how they find out all the information they need to know to explain what's going on. This is kind of the, the analog version of that. I'm not sure why. This was actually the first scene we shot of the film. This was day one, scene one. I just want to know what they say. I think they may be in Polish, but... And that is actually uh, absolutely 100% in Polish. <laughs> we were very specific about that. I even had to write out what was in that, that journal entry in case somebody would, would freeze frame, which I assume someone will, and uh, put it up online. We wanted to, 
to try to be at least a step ahead of that. Uh, this next shot coming up is one of my favorites in the film. What are these? It's another example of drawing a shot on a chalkboard in prep and feeling like it would be amazing, but not being certain that we could do it. Our camera and the windows of the car, our camera was exactly three quarters of an inch smaller than the vertical give of this, of this open window. So Henry had to pull the car up into a very specific mark. We could not move left or right. The camera had to fit and clear the window with you know, less than a quarter of an inch on each side, clear the next window, and execute a tilt to the house, which is absolutely meant to be our little nod to the Exorcist poster right there. But that shot, that was take two. Um, and I was already, I remember after the first take, sitting there trying to figure out how we would break it up and abandon that ambitious through two windows uh, shot that is unenhanced by computer. That was just uh, an incredible victory of, of my grip and electric and camera departments. I changed my mind. More Apollo uh, news there. Uh, the spirits that possess Doris are really fascinated by, uh, by the space program. What all the fuss was about. Another real change coming up here, our second to last. Lulu Wilson, again, doing more with stillness. These are the reasons why I, I have to work with Michael Fiminari as my DP on everything I do. I don't want to leave the house without him. I don't want to take a selfie without Michael Fiminari at this point in my life. Gloria. He really goes out of his way uh, to try to make these films as aesthetically beautiful as he can. Um, there's this, there is kind of a prescribed uh, aesthetic for, for contemporary horror, and you see it a lot. It, it's very clean, um, it's desaturated, it, it tends to live in this very blue, kind of cool color temperature throughout. Everything is kind of given this golden or cobalt brush on everything. And, um, we actively try to avoid that on every project. This in particular, uh, Gloria, just the, the warmth of the, the kind of pre-sunset uh, look that he's going for in this. Um, I remember seeing it on the day and, and uh, just being blown away. Lynn, is that right? Remarkable. This is another uh, wonderful example of, you know, when all you, need, all you need to do to make a scene work is put three actors around a table. Um, I remember we did one take where Lulu was looking at the board and looking around the table, and on take two, um, we had, uh, she and I went and talked about the scene and, and had talked about the idea of, what if you just never take your eyes off of, of Henry? And uh, you can see how unsettled he is um, just because, oh, that little tiny twitch that she did there when she didn't know the answer. Um, it's not important. It's such a subtle moment, and that Lulu just in, instinctively did that. Um, it's just, um, just amazing. Hide. Behind. We have a war of zooms happening here. I mean, this is vintage, vintage 70s coverage here. Zooming in, zooming out. Yeah. It just keeps you completely off balance. And then to complete a zoom by landing in a profile. Happy. Racking focus. Simple little things like that. Um, that just really, to me, when we, uh, when we were designing these sequences, that you know, really, really made me feel like we were putting together something that... Thank you, Doris, for doing that. The kind of movie that, that I would have watched, the kind of movie that introduced me to horror in the first place. I'm afraid that's not the only reason I came by. Lena's gotten herself into some trouble at school. What? Isn't that right, Lena? I'm sorry. I believe we shot the scene over two days um, just because of the... I'd rather not talk about it. Because of the shot count of the coverage here. Um, we can talk in your office in the morning. I'd prefer to speak to you about it right now, if that's all right. I promise it won't take long. We could go up the to little tiny techniques here, like when Annalise grabs Elizabeth's elbow in just a second, now, where we yeah. try to punctuate an emotional moment by using a tiny little zoom. You think you could manage to hold down the fort on your own for a few It used to communicate, in, in older movies, it used to communicate a character thinking deeply. Looks up. She looks... Tiny zoom. Can I watch TV? And it's only on screen for about a second. But it, it really, that, that technique of kind of pulling you into the thought process of a character, um, we do it differently these days. And so finding those little moments was really, 
uh, some of the most fun that we had. In fact, this was just a fun movie, especially for me and Michael. Over there. there were times uh, we used to joke on set that, um, you know, they, they had trusted us with this franchise that had performed so, so well. Uh, the first Ouija movie did, you know, 104 million worldwide. It, it was a bona fide hit. And they trusted us with the follow-up. And here we are throwing this very kind of uh, this outdated aesthetic at a movie that's aimed at contemporary teenagers. Yes. And uh, we used to joke uh, that we felt like the valets in Ferris Bueller's Day Off just driving this beautiful car that they had given us, which was this, you know, this big franchise. We were just driving it off into the sunset. And sooner or later, someone would show up and check the mileage on it, and we would be in big trouble. But much to my delight, you know, everyone was watching our every move, it turned out. And, um, this was about me. and as every time I was expecting someone to show up and pull the plug, they were more and more excited about what we were trying to do. And that's just very rare. She started by calling me darling, an easy guess, a common term of endearment. Now, this is something, again, it's a, it's a requirement of the genre. And, you know, when you sit down to kind of write eight pages of exposition, um, you're always nervous because it is a requirement of the genre. Everybody knows there's the scene where someone explains to you what the nature of the haunting is and what's going on. But we were thinking, you know, we were thinking about the changeling. We were thinking about the exorcist, which have these long moments where people just discuss what's happening. And we wanted to, to lean into it. We didn't want to try to shortchange it or, you know, kind of do the quick little two-minute Google search version that you see so often. She said, Lynn, when I asked... Having to cover it, we made the decision that the sun would set during the scene, which is why everything is so bright and glowing downstairs. The sun's already gone behind the trees here. You'll notice the lighting is changing constantly uh, throughout this. We all heard it. It was a woman's voice. That's all. And that way, we had kind of split this entire expositional sequence up over three very distinct lighting aesthetics. And uh, that not only helps you feel like you've heard the whole story, but it keeps things visually fluid. It keeps things changing, which is pretty critical if you want to hold someone's attention for this long. I don't think your daughter is a fraud. I believe she is channeling powers and forces we do not understand, but I'm certain she was not channeling my wife. Yeah, that was a cheap one, I admit it. But you know what? It makes everybody, like, scream every time I've seen it with an audience. Now, that last little scene that uh, Henry just performed, everything he's talking about is actually a technique called cold reading that, that is used by uh, mediums and psychics and people like John Edward and... You know, uh, especially a lot of those televised, you know, psychic reading things. The techniques he describes about, you know, using vagaries, referencing single words, opening with a term of endearment, uh, even a generic one, in order to kind of make people feel comforted. An appeal to comfort, I think, is what he says. Um, all of that's very, very, very real. And uh, we, had, we had actually initially written a lot more of that into there, but it, it felt at that point like it was a bit of a lecture. There's treasure in the walls. We used it to pay the bills. Yeah, I heard about that, kind of. The treasure in the walls, is that for real? I'll show you. And now you'll notice the light outside is dimmed even further. So that the next time we cut upstairs, we're actually getting into nighttime. Because, you know, you know you have to go into the third act of a horror movie on, on a dark night in a dark house. And so now here it is. Sister Hannah came here from Poland. Light's fading even further. I asked her to translate them. It upset her a great deal. This is a journal from a man named Marcus who grew up in Poland during the Second World War. This is one of my favorite, favorite things to do. He talks about his family and how they were rounded up by the Germans during the invasion. I started my career as an editor. Uh, that's how I made my living before they, before uh, people decided to let me make movies. Ooh, there's the Oculus mirror um, right in the corner there. I kind of had a joke we, when we realized that there was a, a place to put the mirror in the movie. They kind of made me think, well, maybe uh, there's a way of looking at this, that this is actually a prequel to Oculus. Um, but, uh, yeah, just little little Easter eggs that, that I enjoy. But um, this kind of cross-cutting where, uh, you know, these scenes were written 
to be complete. It, it wasn't scripted that we were cutting back and forth between the story and this, uh, but I always knew that I would. Um, and I would have to explain uh, to the producers when we were going in, and they'd say, you know, it looks like Father Tom's talking for seven pages. And I'd say, yes, but everything with Doris and Mikey is going to be braided through, uh, sometimes even if it's just for a line, just for a moment. Um, and that's going to help add momentum to what is essentially a campfire story. Um, so, yeah, this, this is some of my favorite kind of work to do. He says the doctor had a secret room in the basement where the experiments continued. Now, this entire sequence, we've been relying on zooms. In fact, I, I think every camera move you've seen for the last few minutes has been a zoom. Uh, we get very, very zoom heavy in this stretch um, because once we officially begin the third act, um, I wanted to open it on a massive steady cam shot. Uh, so to get there, I really wanted to be living in our zooms as long as possible. There's a, a gentle hypnotism that slow zooms kind of create, and, and it creates the impression as though you're being forced to slowly lean forward while someone is talking. And that, that kind of gives you the sensation you have, you know, if you're sitting around a campfire and listening to a ghost story, I, as a kid, would always slowly, completely subconsciously lean forward in my seat. And uh, that's what this kind of camera work accomplishes. If it's done well, you don't even notice that it's happening to you. Now, this is, I remember on the script, this was one of the moments we didn't know how it would work. The idea was that her face kept cycling and changing over his shoulder out of focus. Voiceless. And we wanted to make sure that it wasn't, you know, we didn't call too much attention to it. Things that were never here. He was zooming all over the place at this point. were taking him over. You were right. What you said about this house. This shot, that moment was, uh, I was doing my best, along kind of like what we did with Rear Window. Um, I think the best jump scare in uh, cinematic history is in Jaws, uh, when Dreyfus is examining uh, Ben Gardner's boat, and he tugs on it, and uh, the face just pops into frame, almost exactly like, like it just did. Uh, and what was fascinating to me about that is typically you time a, a sting to land on the first frame that you can see the startling image. But what happened with Jaws is that the sting is late. Uh, the hit. The hit comes a few frames late. It's, af it's kind of as the face settles into frame, not as it is first introduced. And it's one of the most effective jump scares I've ever seen. Uh, so we, we wanted to do that. Shh, shh, don't say anything else. Something else I really wanted to do was to open the door of, we need to do an exorcism, which is exactly what you expect must be happening at this point. And then to quickly just kind of, nope, nope shut up, we're not doing one. Uh, and just get rid of the, <laughs> get rid of the expectation entirely. Uh, because I, I do feel like because The Exorcist is so incredible, a lot of these scenes, you see a man in a collar, you know The Exorcism is happening. Okay, so this is the big Steadicam move. We started actually on a, uh, I believe we were on a, on a bit of a lift, and Steadicam operator was boomed down, tracking with them, backed up into the foyer. We wanted this all to just be one big move that showed us the whole downstairs. We didn't want to hide any cuts or cheat. They had already flown out the lift that he was standing on in order to get that first shot. And right there, we... Uh, this was, you know, letting sound design kind of drive the atmosphere. This is another opportunity to rip out the score instead of smothering it with frightening score, uh, which is kind of the playbook these days. Um, we wanted to pull it all out, let the, uh, the thumps and the clock do the work. This is still all the same shot. It looks like we could have hidden an edit when we panned over here because we go into shadow, but we didn't. This is all the same. And I think all that silence buys us that. That's actually the exact uh, place that uh, Debbie in the first film uh, hangs herself before the credits. Um, he's hanging from the exact same spot uh, that, that she is at the beginning of the first. Now this song, this is a public domain song from the, uh, oh geez, I think I want to say the 30s, it might be the 40s, uh, but uh, it's called Goodbye Little Girl Goodbye. And um, I was given a, a number. I, I had requested something for this record player to play in the house this, this whole time in lieu of score. And uh, I combed through a couple dozen of, of the songs and uh, listened to this one, and Girl, it just seemed to work so well with, with what we were going for thematically. I used to listen to it in my car on repeat on my way in and out of work for prep for months before we actually shot. It's like the stupidest idea in the world. 
Annalise uh, rightfully declares that splitting up is the stupidest idea in the world. Down there, we're burning that thing in the furnace. Which is also, that was kind of me talking to myself uh, while we were writing. Uh, because I, I said, well, naturally, here's where they split up. And I had to kind of remind myself that, no, that's the stupidest idea in the world. Doris? So here we're off of our zoom kick. Kind of starting with the third act, I wanted to switch off of the long zooms and let the camera float a little bit. These are crane shots here. We did the, uh, the basement. The entire basement was built on a stage. In the first film, the basement was actually in the house, and we built it to match. Even the furnace is the furnace from the first film. Um, but this is all a stage because we needed to be able to get into the secret room and, and have room to work. Let's burn that. That's also a bit of a cheap one, I'll give you that. Uh, but yeah, we had to, uh, we had to just pump up, a, pump up a sting on the light bulb. Um, the actual sound it makes is just kind of a little... And that wasn't very scary. <laughs> These bodies that are in the wall, I wish we could see them more clearly uh, because I, I loved them. But there, there are a number of them in the frame. Uh, some of them have metal plates fastened to their face. Some have, there's one on the right that has a fork-like device holding the chin up from the chest. Those are all different all torture devices and, and uh, things we found from, from real stories of, uh, of killers in the, in the 20s and 30s. I honestly don't know. And now we're starting to reintroduce the zoom here because eventually I wanted to get off of the expected. Now we've been gliding unsteady. We've been, we've been using uh, cranes to get big moves. We're going to do another one to get through the vent here, but I wanted to start bringing the zoom back because that's, that's where I wanted to live once we kind of got into the room. And one of our few continuity movie, uh, errors in the movie is that given the geography of the, uh, of the basement, you should be able to see Elizabeth's legs behind him. But by the time we shot this, they were gone for the day. And we just kind of hoped no one would notice. And then I just ruined that. So this room existed in the, in the first film, although we did take some liberties in, in changing the aesthetic. Some of the details uh, that we added, this little cage on the wall um, actually has little markings inside. We never featured them in close-up, but little, tiny little touches that someone had been in there and making little marks on the rock. Uh, and I think uh, we counted them at one point. They'd been in there for, uh, for something like 75 marks up there. For 75 days, they'd been held. I had really, really wanted to let as much of this live in silence as possible. Um, you can get so much more tension out of a footstep on a floor uh, than you can out of scary music. That's where we died. Our Father who art in heaven. He can't see this house, Father. If he could, none of us would still be here. When we got into post, we actually um, brought in a group, a loop group, to provide these additional voices. And we recorded, I think, several dozen people reading these lines. And we would go through one at a time and identify the voices we wanted to use. We would affect them differently and then try to Come with me. try to sync them up with Lulu. Yeah, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I shall feel Is Lulu doing her own stunts again? Lulu insisted on doing her own stunts. <laughs> and, um, which is something Annalise Basso did when we did Oculus. She also uh, demanded to do her own stunts. Uh, but whenever we could put Lulu on a wire, she was very happy. Here's our final real change of the movie. That goes by right there. Father? Where is she? She's part of the walls now. Well, from this point in the script, I knew we were just kind of one... We were one after another when it came to the genre scenes. Awful things. And this stuff is, you know, when you get into this part of, a, of any film, it's all about momentum. And so it was about keeping the camera moving, letting these little scenelets just kind of uh, get progressively shorter. Um, you can actually kind of clock them. 
uh, each of these, this moment between the two of them was kind of born, uh, born at the dinner. There was a version of this when right before he shut the door, he said uh, two words to her, and he said, uh, another life, which is how they left their dinner conversation. And goodbye, Henry Thomas. We ended up losing the line ultimately, uh, just because it didn't feel necessary. We, we thought they were they were doing it all with their eyes. And this shot of Elizabeth is actually not Elizabeth. This is a stunt woman. We just put her face, we grafted her face digitally onto the stunt woman. That's uh, Annalise doing her own stunts. <laughs> I, I've actually. I can't give her all the credit. We we definitely used a double for the for the landing, but at this point, when you're working in a practical location and you need to kind of keep everything kinetic, this is actually the most challenging challenging thing is to is to figure out and and sustain a rhythm with this stuff because everything's about crescendoing up and then dropping back down and crescendoing up and dropping back down, and really the only way for it to work is um, for the durations of each of those kind of sides of it to get shorter and shorter and shorter, and that's what gives you the uh, the sensation of of escalating momentum as a viewer. Speak to me. I'm a vessel. I can help you. She's, She's a better vessel. vessel. What do you want from her? Voice. Take mine. This was a tricky bit, too, because we had to kind of walk a bit of a fine line by not demonizing you know, the, uh, the devil's doctor's victims completely. You know, we wanted to make it clear that she was, you know, possessed by a number of mental patients that had been murdered there, so they were already insane, many of them. But also kind of make it clear that there was something in there that was never human. And, uh... Yeah, kind of riding that line. Um, this, uh, another very controversial scene in the script that, you know, kind of hinged on the execution was the idea of bringing, um, bringing their father into the story in this way. Dad! To kind of support the unreality of that, we pulled out all of the actual sound from the scene until she started sitting up, so he actually, even his clothes don't make noise. And we're back in this scene. I didn't. Dad gave me. I love when movies circle back on top of each other, and this this is something too that was a technique used very often in, in the '60s and '70s. And uh, this was a, a wonderful chance to play with that. It was also one of my favorite pieces of score here. So the implication that I was going for here was that yes, their dad did do that to the doll in the mysterious ways that ghosts can affect things. You notice he never is actually able to speak. But to give her a clue as to how to, how to stop this, but that he knew uh, in doing so, Doris would not survive. We had written lines for that, just in case you always want to protect yourself. And we had, we had him actually say at one point that, you know, she'll be safe with me. And we took it out just because it was, it was not necessary. Sweetie, don't. There was a deleted scene when Father Tom encounters Doris down there where we see a blonde woman here on the slab, and, and we see the doctor himself, also played by Doug Jones, leaning over her. And screams and screams and screams. No, he doesn't. I also was surprised I was able to get away with the smacking a nine-year-old with a chair scene. But I guess, you know, since one of the only things we knew had to happen by the end of the film was that we had to murder a nine-year-old on camera, I guess the chair was not so bad. Now, this is a... Uh, we relied on, on some digital help for this scene a lot more. There's a lot of dust and particles in the air blowing around. You know, of course, the elongation of her jaw... You know, I, I don't typically get to use much CG. I, I don't often like it. This stuff as written was so bizarre that we knew we had to. 
And this was another sequence. I, I added every single stitch into this, thinking that uh, I'd have to remove some for the rating, and uh, we were able to keep them. And back to silence. I knew that if we if we had to kill Doris, and we knew we had to, it was really one of the only things we knew we had. We knew how this had to end. Um, I, I wanted to. I really it was important to me to to send her away, and in a way that was in a way that was at least somewhat okay that she'd be with her dad, and that it was about her. I, I didn't need to see his face and see what it meant to. Daddy. Meant to him, it was about what it meant to her. I do remember feeling when I was editing this together that that cut back to Elizabeth was one of the crueler moments of the of the film. And that way we could just be kind of matter of fact about uh, Doris on the floor. Didn't want to put any melodramatic music. Didn't want to. Didn't want to do much else. Just kind of quietly say, "Yep." That's, that's that. Doris? It all kind of goes back to, uh, you know, the reason we spent the time we did in, in the first act, Doris, uh, Doris not really understanding that her dad was dead. They talk about that, you know, for, for Doris, it's like he went to work and didn't come home. It felt like her fate is so sad uh, that we had to at least give her that. Let, let dad come home for her. I had to. <laughs> to stop the voices. Now, and shooting the anamorphic lenses and uh, cropping it to 69 that I talked about in the beginning is, is why we get this really fascinating lens flare uh, coming off of the lights in the scene. It's a very unusual look, and you can really only accomplish that with anamorphic lenses. This is another time where in the 60s and the 70s, um, these big emotional moments would play uh, without a score. You don't score the emotion. And uh, it was important for us to, to do that. You know, your, your first instinct, your first call is always that you score the emotion, and this we didn't want to. <laughs> this is one of the only scenes we reshot. Uh, when the movie had come together, the, the original version of this, uh, Alice just got stabbed and died, and Lena never snapped out of it. So there was never a goodbye. Lena was always, from that moment on, just kind of crazy, and Alice died very, very quickly and, and without any, any sense of resolution. And so we had an opportunity to go back and, and revisit it, and uh, it was wonderful because I felt like it was such a missed opportunity for a goodbye. And, and for some emotion between these these two wonderful actresses, it was uh, I was very grateful that they let us go back and get this moment, so that we could at least send Alice away well, also. Because from the very beginning, all she wanted, as she said, was to uh, to see Roger again. And the immediate horror of her daughter's death is followed by an immediate reunion in this case. And only it's poor Lena who is left out of that. Everybody's Waiting is actually the, uh, the title of the series finale of um, Six Feet Under. One of my favorite, uh, favorite shows of all time. I'm sorry. Oh, God. I remember uh, when, it, when it first aired, I thought it's a perfect, perfect last thing for someone to say. Lena. Lena. It's uh, the great John Prosky, his father, Robert Prosky, you may remember as The Judge and The Natural and uh, The Priest and Rudy, such a wonderful movie. And, um, this is his son, a phenomenal actor in his own right. Um, this sequence was also uh, not the original ending. We used to go outside and see the bodies being pulled out. There's a big scene with the, with the police and Annalise. Try to remember. We really wanted to kind of get into... Uh, her into her world inside the asylum, because this is obviously where the where her character is uh, during the first movie. We're, we're kind of the movies are starting to converge. We had originally ended this film um, seeing Lynn Shay, and uh, we ended up going with this instead. 
uh, because it, it felt bizarre to jump out of this time period that we had spent so much time in just for one last scene. To suddenly be contemporary felt wrong. And so uh, it was very important that I spend some time with, with Lena. Um, everybody needed their, their farewell, and we thought that this kind of summed everything up. The only thing that I can say about my mother is that she wanted to know that we weren't alone after my dad died. And now she knows. And that's the sophistication of Annalise Basso, to take vulnerability and innocence and just put the oh. tiniest hint of darkness into it at the end, which I think kind of sums up who, who I considered uh, Paulina Zander to be um, on, her, on her journey to become Lynn Shea in the first film. This was originally uh, just about the second to last thing you saw in the original ending. The ending that I had thought that I liked the most was that she made this Ouija board out of blood on the floor and uh, tried to talk to Doris. And the ending that I liked was that no one ever answered. And we left it with her shouting, are you there, are you there, more and more desperately. And no answer ever came. That was the ending, which is a real downer. <laughs> so, so finally, I, I decided to keep that bit, but figured we could go out on one last good scare. And if we wanted to go out on one last good scare, it was important to me that we tried to do it in one shot. And for this, I wanted everything. I was like, all hands on deck. I want, I want the crane, I want the dolly, I want the boom, and I want the zoom. I want everything. I want every little trick. If I could have thrown a split diopter in there, it would have been perfect everything we could do. So there we are, booming up static, John Crosses. That is actually a double wearing a mask to make her look like Lulu Wilson, because Lulu uh, is actually hanging upside down from the ceiling just outside the edge of frame right now. And as he comes in, we tried to pivot around, put a little zoom in on it as we moved. Annalise, uh, every time we came around in rehearsal, she had a different goofy face. And there's Lulu, actually Lulu. I got to run across the ceiling there which was her, uh, her favorite thing. Now, typically, every other movie I've made, when the credits come up, they just come up. And uh, it's usually always the, the same, you know, same white cards on black. And uh, by the time we had finished the film, the enthusiasm for it was, was such that um, the studio agreed they wanted, a, they wanted a credit sequence and we wanted it to feel vintage and stylized. And, I remember the first time I saw this, um, I thought it was just perfect. And to, to bring in this song one more time made me very happy. So I guess it's really kind of special for me to be sitting here watching this right now. It's about a, about a year after uh, we had finished principal photography, and I'm, I'm actually three days away from starting principal on my next movie. And uh, when this was first brought to me, my first reaction when they said, you know, we'd like you to do a sequel to Ouija, my, my first reaction was of intense skepticism. I didn't know why on earth they would want me to do that, and, and I couldn't imagine a world where it made sense to do that. I, I, I've never wanted to do a sequel. I've never wanted to kind of step into an established franchise before. But they came to me and they said, you know, we, want, we don't just want to do a smash and grab. We don't just want to, to recreate the same movie we'd made the first time, only cheaper. They said, we really want to make something unique and special. And uh, we want to make, you know, the kind of movie that would excite you, both as a viewer and a filmmaker. And they were telling the truth, which is, <laughs> which is not always the case in Hollywood. And kind of every step of the way, I, I, I kept waiting for the rug to be pulled out. I kept waiting for someone to look at what we were trying to do and say, this is a franchise designed for, for teenage viewers. You shouldn't, be, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this to our franchise. And every step of the way, they were more and more excited and more and more vocally supportive of what we were going for. This turned out to be one of the most pleasant experiences I've ever had making a movie. And I never would have imagined that going in. This was a delight, and even more than that, this was kind of a return to a lot of, a lot of emotions that I had, you know, when I was so young and, and first being introduced to the genre. Um, the chance to play with that 
again. It uh, turned out to be one of one of the best times I've ever had uh, making a movie. And um, a lot of the crew, you know, most of my crew I've had with me since Oculus. I, I have a kind of a, a crew that's a family, and, and we were able to to bring them onto this uh, for the most part. And and coming away from it, the family had grown quite a bit. There are a lot of people that I met making this film that are, are with me now making Gerald's Game. And I, I never really would have expected to have enjoyed this experience as much as I did and to be so proud of the movie. Working within an established franchise and working on a big, you know, big wide release Halloween movie, you know, this was so, so much more fun than I ever expected. And I get to sit here a year later and kind of watch it play while I record this commentary track. And, uh, yeah, it just makes me smile. Horror movies, for me as a kid, were fun. And, you know, they, they weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. They were just turning it so well. And the, the care and the artistry that went into the way they were made you know, a lot of that falls falls off over time, and, and a lot of contemporary horror starts to look the same. I'm really grateful that, uh, that we were able to do something a little different. In this little piece of score, I, uh, I requested uh, that the Newtons give me a, uh, a copy of it as soon as they had finished orchestrating. And now and again, driving to and from set and to and from prep, I'll listen to this track, and it just takes me all the way back. It, it just feels so much, feels so much like the kind of music. Uh, one of my first jobs in the entertainment industry, I was 15, and I was an usher at a movie theater. I used to clean, clean theaters during the credits and drag a trash can around behind me and pick up popcorn and, and drinks and candy wrappers, and I would listen to score. I fell in love with, fell in love with score. And this, uh, yeah, I, I would listen to this and watch these credits roll, and it just reminded me so much of, of being 15 and dragging my little trash can through an empty theater and just kind of feeling, feeling that enveloping, you know, nostalgia that I have for watching movies in a theater. Which is something that, it's an experience that's, you know, thankfully still still at the very forefront of, of the industry, but people watch movies at home. I watch movies at home. Uh, my home theater setup is, is lovely. I watch movies on, on my iPad. People watch movies on their computers. They watch, some people watch them on their phones. It makes me want to cry. But yeah, just that, that sense that I had of seeing movies in a theater, um, looking at the, the real changes go by, the cigarette burns, you know, listening to those beautiful orchestral scores from James Horner, um, Jerry Goldsmith, um, Alan Silvestri, and Williams, and, you know, this, uh, this experience recreated that for me. And I think if, if it does that, you know, even for a small percentage of, of the teens today that haven't had that experience the way I remember it, if it can even just kind of give them a little piece of that, uh, then that's, that's why I wanted to make the film. And uh, that's, why, that's why I'm proud of it. Uh, so what you're, what you're about to see was the original ending of the film. This was uh, originally the very last scene. We decided to include it after the credits uh, because it is such a direct link and because Lynn Shea, who is such a, not only a wonderful actor, but just a, a wonderful woman, um, I was really uh, honored to work with Lynn, even on one shot where she didn't say a word. And uh, it just felt very appropriate to kind of leave it with her. Though it was funny when we tested it, people who hadn't seen the first movie recognized her immediately when she turned around and assumed that we were connecting this movie to the Insidious franchise, which is also unfortunate. And they said, oh, did you say it's Elise? There she is. So thank you so much for listening, and uh, thank you for supporting Blu-ray. Take care.